Hello and welcome to part seven of the short story series, A Day in the Life of Julian of Norwich, narrated by myself, ICSI All Things. If you'd like to follow along, please subscribe and hit the bell button to be informed of the next story posted. Thank you. So Julian of Norwich and Marjorie Kemp discuss life. Lady Julian, ah, oh, that was an amazing luncheon indeed. I do adore peas pottage, it's so warming to the cockles of the heart. Something has been pressing me though to ask you if I may, Marjorie exclaimed. Why yes, I replied, now that we have been refreshed, let us return to the little garden outside and air our thoughts in the sunshine. I'm all ears, my dear. We gathered our skirts and shawls against the spring breeze and made our way through the tiny door into the high-walled, leafy courtyard, scattering bl blackbirds as we went. Amelia the cat was still inside, hoping to be thrown some scraps from the attendant clearing away our lunch. Marjorie began with one of the most difficult questions that thousands of souls before her have asked and millions would ask themselves in the future. I, as you, Dame Julian, have many lost poor souls coming to me for solace, motherly advice and a hearing ear. In fact, they call me the mother in King's Lynn. They demand I pray for them and, and even ask me to tell them if they're saved or not. I do not set myself up to be a teacher as it is forbidden by St Paul for women to do so in the congregation, but I cannot turn these poor and desperate souls away without some hope. Just as there are many of your audience out there in the year 2020 who are in a similar situation with the virus, the repeating plagues starting in the 14th century have decimated half the population of Norwich, as we both know. And we've left so many with hardly a means to survive if they did not die of the Black Death already. Marjorie was building up to her big question with the usual preamble. Your lady, the most difficult question I find of all of them to answer is thus, if there is and a more almighty God of love, why does he allow such pain and suffering? There are many ways to look at this, but I would love to hear from thine own inspirational visions, not just the holy writings, how you would explain this seeming contradiction from an all loving God. Well, Marjorie, I have brought my hidden and nearly finished document with me. I looked furtively around to see that no one was looking and drew it out from underneath my overrobe. Just in case you should ask me this crucial question, which I myself also asked of the Lord Jesus when he appeared to me in the visions on my sickbed, those 40 years hence. I was shown thus that the outer body feels pain and suffering and it is the way it is on earth as we know but if we can accept this not rail against it and ask why me why me then our acceptance can assist the inner self to rise to a height of bliss peace and love this is where we find the strength the wisdom and the will to survive and become sovereign over the outer self, living fully in grace despite our circumstance. Marjorie questioned further. Oh, what wise words. Yes, acceptance is the key to the kingdom of peace and love dwelling within, of course, of course. That is a marvelous way to look at it, I must say. But then, I'm always asked a second question by the wretched who are barely eking out an existence in a terrible way. And that question is, why God allowed sin into the world in the first place, if he can foresee all things perfectly? 
I paused a moment to find the place where I had written about this very same question about fate and destiny. Ah, here is where I recorded my own conclusions, Marjorie, after mulling it over in my mind these scores of years since he spoke to me. And believe me, I do not say this lightly after so many years to come to this conclusion. He shewed me it was necessary. It troubled me greatly, but I did not understand until the Lord explained to me that all shall be well, and you shall see yourself that all manner of things shall be well. We are set at naught and not always good in our understanding, but we look to his perfect example of love and it humbles us just as the suffering does. Through our trials, we are purified in a kind of alchemy of our soul, and then no longer slaves to our earthly bodies and inward passions, we become forever grateful for his generosity in suffering and pain. This inner knowing brings forth gratitude just like beautiful gold that has been smelted and refined and begins to shine, knowing that one day we will truly understand this all more fully. We are melted down to pure faith and trust that we are beloved, no matter what. Well, 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 I didn't think to compare it to jewellery. Hmm, it seems a gem of an illustration, if you get my meaning. <laughs> she laughed her hearty way and her face lit up again in that wondrous smile that I had begun to love already about her. Well, yes, now, don't you be getting any ideas about selling gold to save their dear souls now, will you? I countered in a teasing way. I know you're a businesswoman, but it wouldn't be seeming for a holy woman of God. I giggled. <laughs> We both burst out laughing together. Too true, imagine, she said. The priests are already fleecing the sheep with their money for prayers and services for the dead. I added more gravely, but we shepherdesses, we give them direct confirmation from our own divine revelations of his love to our own person through the visions that we were blessed to receive. And this we pass on to the peace of people freely without charge. You know, Marjorie, I suddenly have an inspiration through our conversation. I will call my book Divine Revelations of Love. Now that really will set the cat amongst the pigeons and I shall truly have to guard it with my life in secrecy until I can pass it to the nuns upon my death. I smiled at Marjorie and she beamed from ear to ear. Oh, I do love a secret, she said. And I promise upon my very life, I will never tell a soul of what you write. If you can promise me the same about the one that I plan to scribe of my own visions and travels. I, like you, have been storing these up in my mind over the last 20 years since they started and I'm no longer sure I can recall in the correct order after raising so many children in the meantime. But I know that God will guide me to make some sense of it all, despite the baby brain, as they call it today. And I promise you upon the Holy Bible, I will keep yours a secret too, I said. And I admire you, for your great tenacity in the face of all family obstacles to your becoming a woman of God. And we laughed and continued our walk around the old oak tree as we chatted into the late afternoon. I had questions of my own to pose to Marjorie. I wanted to understand how, despite all that was against her living a life of devotion, was she able to arrange her affairs to give up so much? to become a pilgrim. The only options in these times were to become a virgin nun or to wait until your husband died and you were free to dedicate your life to the church. 
I wanted to know the depth of her desire. Despite running a household with 14 children, handing over her business and leaving her husband. And if you join me in the next episode, you will find out how and why she was determined to move heaven and earth to do this.